So today I like to do a special session with you, a short introduction to climate risk integrated assessment models. Yeah, so we will study the DICE model. So I should start as usual with welcome to applied mathematical finance, but today it's maybe not so much applied mathematical finance, but in the end, uh, we will also move again to discussing interest rates. So how interest rates enter into this model. Okay, they enter in, in a very simple way. Yeah, there's just a deterministic, not even time dependent constant yeah, describing the interest rate, a discount factor. And um, yeah, there's also maybe another aspect to, to study uh, this model because it gives you another view on modeling itself. So the model is quite simple, yeah, so much simpler to what you have seen for the interest rate models, but uh, the complexity comes from yeah, putting simple things together to a big interconnected uh, model. So a short introduction to climate risk integrated assessment models. So what is an integrated assessment model? So this is a class of models that combine the evolution of climate related, so geophysical quantities. Yeah, so what's that? Yeah, that's maybe emission or temperature level with economic factors. So production consumptions, so things we value we then also discount. So we will discuss the DICE model. So the DICE model is a fairly simple yeah, model, fairly simple integrated assessment model. You can look at more complex ones, but maybe a nice guy to study uh, how the model is set up and how it maybe links to mathematical finance, how we, how we can link it to interest rates. Let's have a small introduction to the model. And I also have a, a sketch where I go step by step through all parts of the model. So the DICE model is a comparably simple model. It was introduced by Nordhaus, well, 1992, uh, some time ago, but there were updates. Yeah, there is also a recent update here published. So this reference one here is from 2017. The model has been criticized for some of its simplification and uh, a priori assumption, but it's a nice guide to uh, use it to illustrate how an integrated assessment model works. So the model connects several geophysical and economic quantities. So on one side, I have the climate model. So we will model temperature, carbon concentration, emissions. And on the other side, there is the economy, yeah, population and product productivity will result in the GDP. Yeah. There we can perform consumption or we can reinvest into capital. And the two are maybe also linked by uh, abatement costs. So there is abatement, which means we take a little bit of money to reduce the emissions, which then impacts the climate. And of course, this creates uh, costs. So the quantities are um, connected by simple functional forms polynomial or power laws. Yeah, uh, at first it looks maybe very simple how, for example, the temperature uh, is modeled, how the temperature evolved or how um, the damage to the economy depends on the temperature. It's just a, a polynomial, actually just one parameter uh, square function. Um, but this describes a little bit how the model evolves, say, for 
um, a certain time. And you cannot maybe expect that the model predicts very accurately what happens in say 300 years. Yeah. So this is not the intention. Um, so you somehow calibrate the level and maybe the slope, yeah, and then you connect these quantities. But we had also such simple models, such simple functional forms when we were discussing uh, our interest rate models. For example, just recall how we modeled correlation. Yeah? So correlation for interest rates could be a very complicated thing. And then we reduce it to a one parametric family, just one parameter and say, there is an exponential decay in correlation. Things that are further away are more decorrelated. And sometimes that is enough to catch, capture the core um, effect. So given the model, there is around it uh, also some policy um, optimization. So there are two degrees of freedom. So two parameters we can play with. There is the savings rate. So the savings rate decides uh, how we distribute the GDP among consumption and capital. So if we consume a lot, yeah, there will be no investment in the industry, which affects, of course, maybe the emissions and then the climate. And there is the abatement rate as a second parameter. So the abatement links a little bit the GDP and the um, emissions. So... So we have two uh, parameters that we can choose in the model. And then there's the question, can we find uh, optimal, say choice and optimal policy? So when do you should reduce emissions uh, to maximize some kind of uh, utility function? Well, this utility function is defined on the consumption. So in the end, we get some optimal um, emission path. Yeah, but you do not need to do this optimization. Yeah, you can also just play with some given choice, some given policy that you follow, and then observe how the quantities evolve. So already mentioned, the model is simple, but view it as a very nice, very good example for a whole class of integrated assessment models. So you can maybe improve you know, individual components if you like. Um, maybe a small remark. When I prepared this lecture, you know, I had to learn the model you know, and I also implemented the model. And so I looked up uh, other implementations on the internet. And if you look up implementations on uh, the internet, you have to be a little bit careful. So um, the model comes uh, from the um, economic side. Yeah? So uh, it is a discrete, discretized version, yeah, not a time continuous model. And uh, the time step was fixed to say five years. If you look at the code, you find, yeah, I'm a programmer, yeah, you find really sometimes terrible code that's really very hard to read. So the quantities are one or two letter variables, just the um, objects that you have in the original paper. Yeah, there is the C, the theta, uh, A, B, Y, whatever, E. Yeah, so it's the code is not easy to read. The time step is uh, sometimes hard coded. Yeah, so often the time step is hard coded in the equations, which makes sometimes it a bit more difficult to interpret the parameters. So is the parameter now annualized per year or is it uh, calibrated to the five year period? Yeah, so some of the original parameters are calibrated to the five year period. So you have to be a little bit careful when you um, 
read code on the internet, read, study the model. And uh, this is also a reason why my presentation deviates a little bit, uh, only very, very, very uh, uh, small from the original version, uh, because I try to create um, a time continuous model. So I write all the evolutions in terms of differentials, like we know it from our interest rate models. So the, if there is a quantity that changes over time, for example, temperature, yeah, there is a dx equals, and then some velocity dt. Yeah. And you can just recover the original model if you consider the time discretization, say an Euler scheme uh, with a, a time step of five years. So my implementation uh, is a little bit improved in the sense that I allow for arbitrary time discretizations. Okay, and you also can study that changing the time discretization does not have a big impact yeah, on, on the result, which is good, yeah, which is also checking that the implementation does not have a bug with respect to the time discretization. And maybe another addition, I try to use uh, variable names yeah, uh, that are a little bit more uh, descriptive, yeah, non explicit uh, in, in, in the code. So that's that's uh, a thing where a pro programmer invests maybe a lot of time, yeah, to to find uh, the good uh, variable name. Yeah, let's start with um, a sketch of the dice model. So first quantity, yeah, I would like to state is time. I measure time in years. So if a time step delta t is equal to one, yeah, it is one year. And some quantities are per time. Yeah? For example, emission, yeah, we have emission, yeah, but how much emission do we have? Yeah, we have a certain amount of emission within a certain time span. And quantities that are per time are annualized, so they are per one year. So an example is the emission, so the total amount of CO2 added over time step delta Ti. So this is if the emission is given by this E, so there is the E of tau here. Yeah. So then I just integrate this E of tau over d tau yeah, from little t to t plus delta ti to get the emission over this uh, time step yeah, from little t to t plus delta ti. Of course, you can approximate this by e of t, my emission multiplied with the time step size. Or maybe there's a small typo here, okay, in the integral, it should be maybe here also an i, yeah, so a ti to ti plus one. Uh, so I like to be more precise here with also with the units of the objects. So emissions are in measured in CO2, actually gigatons of CO2. And uh, the emission is gigatons of CO2 per year. So that was time. There is a damage to my economy which is modeled by a damage function. So this damage here is a fraction of the cross domestic product, so of the GDP. So here's my GDP. So it's a fraction of the cross uh, domestic product. So it's between zero and one. And this damage depends on the atmospheric temperature. So if it gets warmer, yeah, we get uh, more storms, yeah, more weather anomalies, and this damages the um, economy. And here we have a very uh, simple model. So the damage depends on 
the atmospheric temperature, that's here the TA, we observe at a certain time. So you see it's a polynomial of the temperature. And this temperature is just the temperature above pre-industrial level. So the parameters of the original model were actually phi one is zero and phi two is 0 0.00236, one divided by Kelvin squared. So you see we have only actually one term, it's this term here. So I have a quadratic increase of the damage uh, depending on the atmospheric temperature. That's the first step in the model. Simplified, I have that higher temperature leads to more damage to our cross domestic product. So the parameter is calibrated well from observations, yeah, or maybe from a more complicated model. And when I now go through all these steps here, let me maybe also switch always to the code. Yeah, and then you have already done the code session uh, while doing this. So I have an implementation of the model here in our financial mathematics library. So there's a package called DICE here, where you also find submodels. And there's the function damage from temperature, which is just um, a polynomial yeah, with three coefficients here. Yeah, the constant coefficients is also zero. So you see the implementation is just that it is a polynomial. Yeah, the argument is the temperature. It's a polynomial in the temperature. And the default parameters are 0, 0, and 0 0.00236. So that is my damage model, damage to the economy, depending on the temperature we observe in the atmosphere. So speaking of temperature in the atmosphere, temperature is actually a vector. So temperature is modeled by a vector in R2. So I have two components. There is temperature in atmosphere and temperature on land and in ocean. So I have two components. Temperature in atmosphere is T A T and temperature of land and ocean is T L O. So the units are Kelvin. And uh, the initial value, so note this is temperature above the pre-industrial level. So my initial value, so actually I should have stated what is T equals zero. T equals zero is I believe now 2015. Yeah? So we have already uh, heated up to 0 0.85 degrees above pre-industrial level at the atmosphere um, and uh, you know, a little bit lower on land and ocean. So now I have to describe how the temperature evolves over time. Yeah, so you see this temperature vector here is a process. Yeah, so it depends on time. So there's temperature evolution. So the temperature evolution so the evolution of my temperature vector this is a function of the so-called temperature forcing so you see the time change of the temperature so dt by dt uh, d capital t by d little t the change of the temperature over time is given by some function of f of t. So that is added 
Yeah. So the temperature increases with this velocity. So the velocity is psi one f of little t, at least in the atmosphere. Yeah. So maybe just note that this component here is the at yeah so for the atmosphere then in addition there is some kind of diffusion yeah so i have a temperature vector so there will be uh, exchange you know, of temperature between the atmosphere and land and ocean so this diffusion part is then modeled by this matrix so the matrix models the transport of heat among the two regimes but the important one is that there is some energy added to the atmosphere by this forcing so this forcing here you know energy added so this forcing has the unit watts per square meter yeah? so there is radiation coming from the outside on the earth and we have this uh, forcing and this parameter here psi one yeah translates this from what per square meter to the change of the temperature which is kelvin per year so simplified what this well, very simple evolution process here tells me is that higher temperature forcing leads to higher temperature. If you perform the time discretization, say for example, as an Euler step, yeah, then you have here the matrix applied to the previous temperature level and then add the forcing, you know, multiply with the time step, uh, add that to the previous temperature level to get the next temperature level. Okay. Um, you can combine this here, you know, so you have a matrix one plus this gamma. So it will be an identity matrix. The temperature stays identical plus some, well, um, disturbance to the identity matrix and then plus some uh, forcing. So this is actually the way the original model is written. So there is some uh, transition matrix here. So this here is now a transition matrix. In the original model, we have this transition matrix for a five-year time step, a five-year transition matrix, and then there is the forcing. Let's have a look at the code for this temperature evolution. So you see I have here evolution of temperature and also temperature. So first look at the temperature vector. As I said, my temperature is just a vector of two components, temperature of atmosphere and temperature of land and ocean. And the default constructor is just creating this temperature vector with the initial values from the original model, you know, from the original calibration of the model. And then I have the evolution of temperature, which implements a function of, say, three arguments, the time index, you know, in case I would have time dependent uh, matrices there, we don't have this. Uh, the previous temperature level yeah, and the forcing, and then maps to the next temperature level. So this is the implementation of this function of these three arguments. So the current time index, the previous temperature and the forcing. And then you see I have here the matrix multiplication with this transition matrix of the previous temperature vector. And then I add the force, then I add here the forcing uh, with this parameter psi one.
Okay, so the very simple evolution of the temperature. And um, these are the parameters from the original model. So you see, this is the transition matrix phi. Yeah. So you see phi one one is actually one plus and minus something. Yeah. Phi two two is actually one minus something. And then you have these guys here on the off diagonal. So you see there is actually an identity matrix and then with some exchange between the regimes. Okay, so we have some transfer coefficients between the uh, regimes. So um, I have this forcing here and you see, I go a little bit backward now through the model. Uh, I describe always a quantity that depends on some other quantity. And then I move to this other quantity. So what is now the forcing? So where does the forcing come from? So the forcing is the temperature change. So you could say the forcing is Kelvin per year, but this is actually, if I multiply the Xi1 with this, so the, this here is wrong. So the forcing is the energy added. So it's what per meter squared. So it's also written here below. So the, the units of the forcing is what per meter squared. The forcing is now a function of the atmospheric carbon concentration. So the temperature forcing is a function of the atmospheric carbon concentration. Yeah, so carbon is black. Yeah, so maybe let's make it gray. So my atmospheric carbon concentration, how much carbon is there in uh, the atmosphere? And this is also a very simple model. So you see there is here the logarithm base two, and then there is the ratio of the current carbon in atmosphere divided by some initial value of carbon of atmosphere. So this initial value is actually the value of the year 1750. And if you have here a log base two, then it means whenever the carbon in atmosphere doubles, the forcing increases by this eta. So the eta parameter here is 3.6813 watts per square meter. So for every doubling in the of the carbon in atmosphere, we will add this amount of forcing to our temperature evolution. And maybe it's nice now to see that behind all these functions, there are maybe some models of their own. So I have here a small Wikipedia link, yeah, we could start reading. Yeah, of course, there is also uh, literature on this, but uh, you already find this number here in this uh, Wikipedia article. And maybe we can have a look. So there is a page on um, radiative forcing. So there is uh, radiation, uh, yeah, so coming from the sun. And there is a radiation balance. And if you read a little bit, you find the subsection forcing due to changes in atmospheric gas. And there is here the model for carbon dioxide. And you see there is here the change in the forcing. 
is 5.35, the logarithm of, this is our reference level, and then the current level in the units of watts per square meter. So now you see here the, the, the number is 5.35, yeah? so, but uh, actually I wrote logarithm base two. Yeah? So what happens if we have a doubling, a doubling of the carbon in atmosphere? So I calculate the ln of two multiplied with 5.35. And you see, this is a 3.70. So our 3.7 is actually this 5.35 multiplied with ln of two. So you also find this here. So a doubling within the next several decades would correspond to a cumulative change in the forcing by 3.71. So that's more or less the constant we have here. So simplified, I can say that I'm modeling higher carbon concentration leads to higher temperature forcing. Okay, so if I add more carbon to the atmosphere, the forcing increases, the temperature increases, the damage to the economy increases. This initial level I had on the slide was 500 gigatons of carbon in the atmosphere. This is the level of the year 1750. Uh, if you like to translate this to quantities that you maybe know, yeah, you could say that uh, one part per million CO2 in the atmosphere is approximately 2.12 gigatons of carbon. So this means that here our 500 gigatons of carbons is the level of 236 ppm. Yeah? So we are already at 400 plus something now. Yeah? So we already have um, a doubling now approximately. So these quantities yeah, just corresponds to, correspond to uh, real uh, quantities. Carbon concentration. I defined carbon concentration so my carbon in atmosphere here but carbon concentration is now modeled as a three vector. So it is a vector in R3. So I have the carbon in atmosphere, but I also model the carbon in the upper ocean and the lower ocean. So the unit of my carbon here is gigatons of carbon. So let's have a look at carbon concentration in the code. So I have the vector carbon concentration. This is my three vector. So there is carbon in atmosphere, shallow ocean, lower ocean. The initial values you know, for the model yeah, are here. 851 gigatons of carbon in the atmosphere, 460, 1740 for shallow and uh, lower ocean. So I have this vector. And my carbon in atmosphere enters into the forcing function. So I also have to describe the forcing function. The forcing function is here. So the forcing function is just a function now of my three vector plus the external forcing, so there's also an external forcing. And here you see this function 
So the first forcing per carbon doubling, my constant 3.6813. And then I have logarithm of the carbon in atmosphere divided by the base value. The base value was this 580 divided by logarithm um, of two. I did not mention the external forcing, right? Okay, there is also no, some uh, external forcing, which is just um, a quantity which you can add here. Yeah? So some forcing that is not related to the carbon cycle, to the carbon in, in atmosphere, which you, which you saw here on the page. Yeah? There's also some, some other part which is just some uh, part that is then added here as constant, yeah, so actually not part then of our, of our modeling. Okay, so now I have linked my temperature forcing to the carbon in atmosphere and carbon in atmosphere is part of my carbon concentration, which is actually a three vector. So the next big part of the model is to describe how the carbon concentration evolves over time. So how is now this vector here evolving over time? So this is the carbon concentration evolution. So the evolution of my three vector M is now a function of the emissions. Yeah? So emissions are dirty, maybe I'd make them brown. And this is a little bit similar to the temperature evolution. So there is some kind of diffusion matrix here, which is mixing the different components of my carbon concentrations. So there is carbon from the atmosphere moving to the ocean. Yeah? So which is actually reducing the speed that we see in the climate change, yeah? which is good, but it's actually bad for the ocean. Yeah? The ocean gets more acid by that. And then there is carbon added, but it's only added to the atmosphere by the emissions. Yeah, So this here is added to the atmosphere. We add the emissions. Okay, and then there is a small thing yeah, in the model when you read the code yeah, or when you read the literature, the emissions are now measured in gigatons CO2 gigaton CO2 per year. Uh, so you have to be a little bit careful. There is here the gigatons CO2 here. So I have to convert gigatons CO2 to gigatons carbon. Uh, so without the two other atoms, the O2. And this gives me then here this uh, conversion factor. Uh, so there is here this conversion factor three divided by 11 you know, times carbon divided by CO2. So I have some conversion factor, but apart from that, I'm just adding my emissions to the atmosphere. So simplified emissions, of course, increase the carbon concentration the carbon concentration in atmosphere, but this matrix here will whirl it around and also transport it to the upper and lower ocean. And there's also carbon coming back from the ocean. So if you discretize this, yeah, so if I do my Euler step, yeah, I get the time discrete model. So the original version, so you have that the carbon concentration for the next time step is the carbon concentration of the previous time step, plus here my matrix and the carbon concentration of the previous time step, plus the emissions 
yeah, multiplied with the time step size. And if you now take the five year Euler step, then this matrix is the matrix that you find in the um, original model. So let's have a look at the code again. So I have my carbon concentration vector, and now I have also an evolution of carbon concentration. So I have this model, yeah, next vector at next time step is my matrix phi times the previous vector plus the unit conversion multiplied with the emissions. And... Um, this here is this uh, matrix. Yeah, you see it is like an identity on the diagonal. Yeah, there's always a one. And then you have coefficients that describe the transport of the carbon, the carbon cycle. You have here the conversion factor, three divided by 11 yeah, for converting uh, CO2 to C. Um, this is my five-year transition matrix. If I like to go in smaller step, actually the best thing is to use a matrix exponential if you like to go in smaller steps. Okay, that's also done here in the code. Uh, but um, apart from that, you just see that applying this function uh, for a given time step with the given carbon concentration at that time and uh, some emissions, it's just apply this transition matrix and add the emissions to get the new value for this uh, three vector. Yeah? And the emissions are added only to the component zero, the component carbon in atmosphere. So you can also look, this is also a model within the model. Yeah, it's a simple model. It's modeling the so-called carbon cycle. So you can also maybe read about the carbon cycle and there can be much more complicated model where you do not model just three regimes. So this is the carbon cycle between atmosphere, yeah, land and ocean and lower ocean. So this is a model within the model. And this is just here a simplified, simplified version of this. Where do the emissions come from? So now it's getting down here. Yeah, so it's getting dirty. So the emissions come from the economy, of course. The emission comes now from my cross domestic product, my GDP. So there is emissions related to the industry, to the GDP. There's also external emissions, yeah? external emissions like land use, uh, which are just added to my model. So uh, just a constant added to this, the dynamic part in my model is here the emissions that come from the GDP. So unit of the emissions is gigatons CO2 per year. And now I have a model that links the cross domestic product for a given year, so my annualized GDP, that links this to my emissions. So my industrial emissions are linked to the GDP. And let me describe these constants here a bit later. If you just look this and assume that these constants are constant, then you have that a higher GDP comes with more emissions. And it's linear, yeah? So twice the GDP creates twice the 
emissions. In the original paper, the GDP is denoted by Y and sometimes below, yeah, you find also the Y, the letter Y on the slides uh, in the code, I just use uh, GDP. So there are two parameters here. There is the function sigma. So the function sigma models the emission intensity. So it is translating my GDP to emissions. So the units is just gigatons of carbons per US dollar. And actually here it is 10 to the power of 12 US dollar. So uh, 10 to the power of 12 is uh, 1,000, 1 million, 1 billion, 1 trillion. So it's 1 trillion uh, US dollar. So it's the sigma is how much gigaton CO2 per trillion US dollar do we generate in our economy? Yeah. So related to the GDP. There's also another quantity here, which is this mu. And I'm reducing the generation of the emissions by making mu larger. So mu is the abatement function. So it is our effort to reduce emissions in the industry. So the uh, trivial case is that you have a factory that generates emission and side by side you have some direct air capture machine that removes the um, carbon from the atmosphere. No? Of course, this costs money. Yeah? Uh, this will reduce the GDP. Actually, it also reduces the GDP every year. We will come to the cost function then, but it reduces the emission. But there could be also some more easy ways, for example, moving from uh, a dirty power plant to a cleaner power plant. Yeah? Uh, that's maybe uh, cheaper. So I have a parameter that describes my effort to make the um, economy cleaner yeah? in the sense that it scales down how much emissions do we have for a given uh, GDP. Both these guys here, both these guys, so my sigma and my mu depend on time. So I will have models uh, for this. Yeah, I will have a model for the function sigma for the um, emission intensity. Simplified GDP comes with higher emissions reduced by the abatement factor mu. So I do not have um, a function here for, for this link to the GDP. Actually, this will then just later in my model where I compose all these quantities. So we could maybe start looking into the model. So in the model, I now compose all the quantities. I create my initial values, the vector. Then I create my functions, the damage function, for example, the forcing function with the constant external forcing, the evolution equations. I create all these equations. And then I combine all these guys by just applying all these functions. And here you see that I have this equation that the industrial emissions is my function sigma multiplied with the GDP. And then I multiply with one minus mu, so my um, abatement um, coefficient. Yeah? So this here is my dependency of the emissions on the GDP. 
So I already mentioned I need a model also for this sigma and what is actually this emission intensity. Well, this emission intensity uh, models that we make progress in our economy by becoming more efficient, yeah, even if we do not care here about uh, investing money, especially in reducing the, um, uh, the, the emission. So even without changing the mu. So this Okay, I missed that slide. So this is just that we add the external emissions, yeah, my, my land use, then I get the total emissions. So I need a model here for my sigma and the sigma is now the emission intensity. my emission intensity function. So emission per economic output. So the sigma is modeled as having an exponential decay. And this exponential decay describes somehow that we become yeah, more efficient. So reflecting improvements in energy efficiency yeah, from which uh, yeah, the emission reduction then profits anyway, but this uh, improvement, so this exponential decay here also decays. Yeah? So there is a decay rate for the decay rate. So I have an initial emission intensity. This is my sigma zero here. Yeah? So how many gigatons of carbon dioxide, CO2, do I uh, emit? per GDP, this is just calibrated to what you observe initially, and then you make some assumption on how this uh, decays. Yeah, So you see there is a very small decay rate, yeah, 1% uh, per year, but the, the decay rate itself also this decays. So the original model uses here this expression, one minus one tenth of a percent per five year. Yeah. So since I write here everything in exponential, so in time continuous form, yeah, I recalculate here this parameter to agree with the choice in the original model. If you would like to recover the original model, yeah, you have to just move to the time discrete version. Yeah, that looks like that. So now we are maybe done for the first part for how does the GDP interact with the uh, geophysical world with the climate. Yeah? So I went backward through this. So now going forward, my GDP generates emissions the emissions are added to the carbon in atmosphere. Carbon in atmosphere creates a temperature forcing. The temperature forcing acts on the temperature and the temperature then creates damage to my GDP. Uh, so the fraction of the GDP that is damaged, that is reduced. So I have this nice little model. All the models are maybe models of their own, maybe simple, yeah, but you can also look up where they come from. So now we have to model the economic part. So how does the GDP evolve? So, and if I'm done with this, then I can describe some kind of welfare, some kind of social welfare, where the social welfare is now my GDP. But from that, I have to remove the damage. And there's also another cost factor that I have to remove. I have to remove the cost to make my uh, 
economy climate neutral to reduce the emissions so to increase the mu yeah so my abatement costs are the result of increasing increasing the mu so making the uh, economy cleaner yeah is costing something so this is the big control parameter here in my model so if i make the economy clean yeah, in in just a single year yeah then this generates uh, large costs yeah and one likes to balance here damage with uh, with cost yeah you, know, you could you could question this approach but uh, this is uh, what actually this uh, control problem here so finding the optimal emission path yeah uh, is doing so let's talk about the cost so for my um, abatement there are abatement costs so you see in this abatement cost there is my nice abatement parameter mu entering here and then it is yeah the model looks a little bit strange so it is here my abatement cost lambda is b of t times one divided by a parameter mu to the power of that parameter where this is actually the price of extracting or reducing um, the emissions. So you see the initial value of this B here is 500 divided by, or 550 divided by 1000 trillion US dollar per gigaton carbon CO2. So you see this here is a price to remove gigaton carbon CO2. The back, backstop price. This price is also then modeled by a small exponential decay, modeling that advantages will make it cheaper to rem rem remove uh, carbon from the atmosphere, for example, yeah, direct air, air capture, if you like. But why does the model look like that? Okay, so what's that? The parameter theta two here is calibrated to being 2.6. So what does this mean? If you look at this function here, Okay, uh, if you differentiate it with respect to mu, yeah, you see that this is canceling. So this form here has something to do with the slope. The slope of this function as a function of mu at mu equals one is one. And that's also the motivation here. So for mu equals one, the slope of this function is one. So recall mu is the fraction that we apply to our um, GDP that does not generate emissions. So the emissions that we have cleaned. And if the slope at mu equals one is one, it means that the guy in front is actually the price of removing the CO2 for the last percent. So when you move from 99% to 100%, this is the price that we then at the end pay. So removing the CO2 is very easy in the beginning. So there are low hanging fruits, you could say. Uh, just replacing an inefficient factory with a more efficient one yeah, is it's it's maybe very cheap yeah May, maybe you even gain money yeah, because the the factory is better anyway yeah, the new one um the, the new power plant but removing the last percent 
is very expensive. And removing the last percent is maybe as expensive as direct air capture would be. Yeah. So just place somewhere a machine that removes CO2 from the atmosphere. Yeah. So that's maybe somehow the price for the last percent. So you see by that, that this quantity here in front is the price of removing the last percent of CO2. So, may, so, so moving to 100% clean because this function here has slope, yeah, so change uh, equal to one for mu equals one. So you can interpret the B of zero as the limit price, the marginal price to achieve 100% uh, abatement. And then the 2.6 is just the factor that now yeah, models how curvy this function is. So it is cheap in the beginning and then it's increasing. Yeah? So if, for example, this uh, would be just one, it would be linear yeah, and otherwise it is curvy. So it just models how cheap it is in the beginning. So you could say it models the um, average price. Yeah? So the 2.6 model somehow that you believe in average, yeah, you are uh, at 505 uh, divided by 2.6 US dollar per ton uh, CO2. Now you see um, US dollar per ton CO2. So my unit of the lambda is trillion US dollar because the units of my GDP was trillion US dollar per gigatons of uh, CO2. Yeah? So uh, the giga, gigatons, giga is a 10 to the nine, yeah? 10 to the power of nine. So I have a 1000 US dollar per ton carbon CO2. This is the unit of this quantity. And if then I say that the B0 is 550 divided by 1,000. Okay, then this 1,000 here cancels. Uh, so you see the B of zero actually describes that I believe the limit price is 550 US dollar to remove one ton of CO2. And if you look that up on the internet, that's a value that is were somewhat on the larger range of um, the cost of direct air capture yeah, that is uh, assumed. Yeah? So it is quite expensive. Uh, recall that currently the uh, market price uh, for the certificate that are traded are 100 euro per uh, ton CO2 is currently the CO2 price. Yeah? So this is five times uh, this. Uh, it is the limit price. So there is a price to pay uh, to uh, um, abate, yeah, to make this uh, cleaner. Also, um, another important remark, yeah, note that these costs apply every year, yeah. So like the GDP, yeah. So this is like having the direct air capture machine next to the factory. This uh, this is the cost that this machine takes per removing the gigaton CO2. So actually, there should be here also a per year. Yeah? So maybe that's a typo. Yeah? The unit is here per year, no? like, in the, like in the GDP. I made a small change to the original model. The, in the original model, the definition of the lambda includes the sigma. Recall sigma, what was it? It was the carbon intensities, the emission intensity. So how much emissions do I get per GDP? So here my lambda is multiplied with the emissions. In the original model, lambda times sigma times GDP. Yeah, So sigma times GDP is emissions. In the original model, the lambda includes the sigma and is then directly multiplied with the GDP. So it's a fraction of the GDP. That's now the cost side. 
Now, how does the GDP evolve? Okay, this is a classical economic model. So let's go through this maybe a little bit quicker. So once I have paid these costs, so there is my GDP, but from that I remove my abatement cost and I also have my damage. Yeah. So from my damage GDP, I remove my abatement cost. Then I have some net value. And this net value is then distributed among consumption and investment. So consumption is yeah, what we consume. Yeah, So we are happy if we consume. Uh, investment is going into the next cycle of the economy and creating the GDP of the next cycle. Uh, the parameter that decides how much we consume and how much we invest is the savings rate. So there is the parameter S of T, which is between zero and one, which just decides how much do we consume? How much do we invest? And besides the abatement coefficient, this is the second free parameter. Actually, both parameters are functions. So the second free parameter function that we use to perform optimization. So we can decide how much do we consume, how much do we uh, reinvest. In my impl implementation, I just use it. It can be chosen as a function, but I just use a constant uh, value. So the investment determines the GDP for the next time period. And yeah, my consumption defines then some welfare so I can value yeah, the um, outcome. So this enters into some uh, utility function. For the first part, my investment increases capital. Uh, so there's some capital deprecation over time, which is here, and then it increases capital and the capital together with some productivity and um, population, uh, which is just a classical model, then defines the GDP for the next uh, time step. So the utility function that we have from the consumption yeah, is just a classical utility function. For example, here the model uses x to the power of one minus alpha divided by one minus alpha, which looks like that. Yeah. So if we have more to consume, we are more happy. Yeah. But uh, there is uh, there is some decay. Yeah. Double the consumption doesn't make you twice as as happy. So the utility I have it for every time. So this is then discounted with a discount factor. And here we see that interest rates enter. Yeah? So how important is the future for us? Yeah? How important is it to consume now or to have um, a viable economy in the future? Uh, and this then defines the quantity W, our welfare, the quantity that we would like to optimize to maximize. So I would like to choose now mu and the savings rate, mu and s, such that we maximize here the integrated discounted utility uh, derived from our consumption. Okay, so that is now the part that this defines my 
target function, my objective function, my total welfare. And here you see now uh, yeah, the parameters interacting with the other parts of the model. So I hide it here, the climate part in this box. Yeah? So where we stepped already through the code, uh, the climate generates damage to my GDP. If I would like to reduce the emissions, there are abatement costs. No? So my emissions can be abated by the parameter mu here, so reduced. Okay, the GDP generates emissions. From that, my savings rate decides how much do I distribute between the capital, which generates the next GDP, and my consumption. And this then defines the welfare via the utility function. And we are taking the sum and discount the total welfare. So now the problem is, maximize this by changing mu and S. Yeah, that was um, a tour through the DICE model. Yeah, actually, it's just that. Yeah, so I believe I have covered all the things. Uh, we can have a look at the code. Yeah? So I already mentioned that you can find an implementation of the model here in our library yeah so actually in this package so let's continue and explore the code so what is uh, missing yeah you see i also have an evolution of the population yeah so there is a very simple law describing how the population will change okay there is also a law that models the evolution of the productivity of the society. Okay, these are maybe classical, simple models. Okay, then I believe I have stepped through all this. Uh, here is also the function with the capital. So my evolution of the capital, the capital deprecation with the parameter you've seen on the slides. And at every time I add the investments. So we have described all these functional dependencies. And then, as I mentioned, all these functional dependencies are put together here in this um, in this little class. Yeah, that is then the whole model. So maybe let's step through this again. So I evolve now over all time steps. Yeah, I take the time from my time discretization. So the first thing is I calculate the forcing from the current carbon concentration. From that, I calculate the uh, temperature using the current temperature and the temperature forcing. Then I calculate the carbon. So I have my GDP, my emission intensity functions gives me the emissions, but my emissions are reduced by the parameter mu. Okay, I will comment on this uh, next. My emissions add to the carbon concentration in atmosphere. So then to the costs, I have damage. Yeah, the damage is a function, damage function of the temperature. The damage is a fraction of the GDP. So this is the total damage in US dollar 
trillion of US dollar. I also have abatement costs, which is now just a function of this mu. This is my, my uh, mu. I subtract the two cost parts from my GDP. So I have the net GDP. Then I have my savings rate. My savings rate is just a function of time. I distribute the, the remaining GDP to consumption and investment. The investment is entering the capital. I have an evolution process for population and productivity, which define by this simple model, the GDP. Yeah, okay, you could also offload this to another functional form here, if you like. This is the cycle closing and creating the next uh, GDP. Yeah, okay, so, and if you then start here on top, if you then start here with this GDP on top, yeah, okay, so you see that the GDP will then again create emissions, yeah, and uh, will be added to the carbon cycle, yeah. So this is my temperature cycle, this is my carbon cycle where the emissions are um, added, yeah. And below here, there is the cycle for the GDP. So I have consumption. So from this consumption, this is here, I define the utility function. And then I have a discount factor. And this defines then the discounted, discounted value. And summing it up, I have the sum over all the discounted values. Okay, so this loop propagates through all these functions and calculates these values. Yeah, so we have a small um, model and I have a small experiment here. So let's also have a look at this. You find this DICE model experiment in this other repository where I have some experiments with the library. So there is in this experiments repository here, uh, experiment with the dice model. So the dice model experiment. So actually I have here two functions. Let's start with the first one, plot abatement scenarios. So what I do is I create here an abatement function. Maybe I close these other guys here first. So I create here an abatement function. And you see, this is a function that starts with an initial value of 0 0.03. So we assume that our economy already uses 3% um, to make it clean. Yeah, So have an abatement rate of 3%. So we start with mu equals 3%. And then I move to the maximum level of 100%. Yeah. Well, in this time period, and this time period is either 30 years, 50 years, or 100 years. So it takes 30 years to make the economy clean, 50 years or 100 years. So I have here three different functions, three scenarios I'm trying out. My time discretization goes to 500 years one year time step. So this is my time discretization. And then I just create my climate model with this abatement function. You see this here is the dice model with my time discretization, the abatement function, the savings rate functions, and the discount rate. Yeah? So my parameters are mu, s, and r. My discount rate is 3%. And my savings rate is this 0.26 here. Yeah, so, oops, 0.26, this 26%. Yeah, maybe you can then plot uh, different graphs. I will plot the temperature, the carbon concentration, the emission, the GDP, and the abatement. Let's let's maybe run this little program that plots several of these scenarios for different yeah, assumptions on when we achieve 100% abatement. So this here is 
I, I achieve 100% abatement in 100 years. So this is maybe not so interesting. This is the economic output. And you see your emissions will first rise and then drop down to zero in 100 years. Your carbon concentration in the atmosphere will rise yeah, and then it will slowly go down so this is here the effect of this diffusion you have yeah okay so it will slowly go down i do not have a negative emission technology here so i'm not removing more yeah so my my economy becomes um, neutral and you see that is uh, this here is a bad scenario so we move to 4.5 degrees above uh, pre-industrial level and we already start here yeah? so uh, this is too late and we should reduce it here uh, faster yeah you see also here there is almost no decay yeah we stay at this level if you go to 50 years yeah it's maybe similar okay so this output is not so interesting emissions go down at 50 years carbon concentration yeah Okay, goes much earlier down, yeah, also faster than, and uh, temperature rises only to three degrees. And maybe let's have this guy here next to it. So this is my abatement scenario where we go to zero in 30 years. Yeah, you see the carbon concentration drops quickly, and uh, so the emission drop quickly, and um, the carbon concentration does not rise so high, okay, so much smaller, decays earlier and faster, and my temperature scenario yeah, is also better, but maybe not, not good enough, yeah, okay, it's already late, and um, maybe we have to have negative uh, emissions. So you could play with this. This is, of course, here not calibrated, savings rate is constant, yeah, and uh, you could also calibrate here the slope, the shape of this function, having an overshoot, yeah, re removing more. So we had this little session. Now to finish an interesting thing, the social cost of carbon, which is also in the original paper. And I could now calculate a sensitivity. Yeah. So a partial derivative of my quantities. Recall the W or the V. No, actually it's the V here. Yeah. yeah. Uh, is the value. And I could now check how does the value change if I do not consume so much. And how does the value change if I add more emissions? Yeah. So what does it make to my utility if I make these changes. And if you now take the ratio of how does the value change if you increase the emissions and how does the value change if you change your consumption, then you get actually the derivative, the consumption differentiated with respect to the emissions. Yeah, And consumption is a part of your GDP is in US dollar. actually times 10 to the 12, yeah? it's part of the GDP. And emissions is a gigaton CO2. So if you build this ratio, actually you get the price of one ton CO2 divided by 1000, okay? Because gigaton is 10 to the power of nine and trillion is 10 to the power of 12. So if I take this, differentiate the consumption with respect to emissions, and if I multiply it with 1000, and then also multiply it with minus one because it is negative, I get the price yeah, of CO2. It is the social uh, cost of carbon. So the social cost of carbon is defined like that. And 
let me calculate this uh, numerically in my little model. So in my little model, there were two small ugly additions to the code. So I have here this parameter emission shift and I just shift my emission vector by this value if it is not zero, okay. And there is the same trick to the consumption below. So here for the consumption, I have some consumption shift. Okay, and I can now just shift this value and calculate a finite difference. Yeah, let's do that. So this is here my second experiment. I'll make that small, my second experiment. So I create my climate model and calculate the value. I create my climate model with the same parameters, but I do a small shift to the consumption and calculate the value. And I have the same and do a small shift to the emissions. And then I calculate the finite difference. Actually it is upshift minus value divided by shift size, but the shift size is here the same. So if then I divide by the other derivative, I do not have the shift size. So it is how does the emission change divided by how does the consumption change? So exactly what we have there with a minus and multiplied with um, a one, a 1,000. And let's plot this as a function of the discount rate. So let's run this program and plot it as a function of the discount rate. So we should see the CO2 price in my model, the model inherent CO2 price as a function of the interest rate. And I get this picture here. And you see at 1%, I have approximately yeah, 100, a little bit more, uh, 2%, a little bit less than 50, and the price rises. So you see how heavily dependent this model is on this choice of the parameter of the interest rate. The interest rate because small interest rate means that future events are more important to us. Uh, so future damages are more important to us. So I would like to avoid this. No? So it's more important to avoid uh, future damages. So this is called the social cost of carbon. So the role of the interest rate in the model, yeah, you can criticize this. The DICE model assumes only a single discount rate R, not even time dependent, but we already seen the discount factor has a strong in impact on the result, a smaller discount factor means that damages in the distant futures are less um, harmful. Yeah? So higher interest rate, smaller discount factor, smaller factor in front of the values in the future. And this is the picture that you find in the original publication, which works very similar, yeah? maybe not identical because I'm not optimizing uh, the the um, abatement scenario, which looks very similar to what we have. Yeah, so for an interest rate of 1%, you get approximately something around 100, 2%, something around uh, a little bit lower than, than 50 for your social, social cost of carbon. Okay, so uh, interest rates have a strong impact on this model. And the reason is the exponential growth. Yeah? You have an interest rate. If you have 10% per year, it's maybe small, yeah? So, but it is an exponential function. And our model runs for large timescales, 100 or 500. 500 years damages in the far future. So, and there uh, interest rates between one uh, or say uh, not so harmful 3% make um, a large uh, difference. Yeah. So at 1%, something that happens in 100 years is 30% important of what happens now. But if you go to say uh, 5%, then something that happens in 100 years is only 1% important as what happens now. Yeah, it is, it is a weight in this, in this sum. So numerical experiments 
we did these, yeah. So these two numerical experiments, different scenarios for different mu's, and calculate the social cost of carbon. And that was it for our little excursion to the dice model. Thanks. That was it for today. <laughs>